since man first put sticks and bones to shells, rocks, and skin-covered logs to express himself rhythmically, percussion instruments have been a fundamental part of his musical expression. Before written history, primitive cultures developed and improved wood fire instruments which could produce a sustained tone. Instruments such as the Kafir pianos of the African Bantus provide ceremonial music and very large bars are even used today for a remarkably efficient telegraph system capable of spanning hundreds of miles and several languages in only a few hours. The marimba of Central America was a well-developed instrument by the 20th century. With elaborately carved facades and tapered wood resonators having tiny membranes called tela, which add a buzzing resonance to the tone, these instruments were the first to attract interest in the United States. Touring marimba bands in the 1890s stimulated the interest of John Calhoun Deegan, who in 1880 had begun making orchestra bells for friends in symphonies and bands. He soon applied the scientific tuning principles and mechanical skills which he had developed to the marimba and xylophone to improve their tonality and design to achieve wider musical acceptance. Both the Central American and early Deegan wood bar instruments were not sharply separated into modern xylophone and marimba types. The difference in names for Deegan marimbas, marimba xylophones, marimba phones, xylorimbas and xylophones were chiefly a function of their place in the scale range. The final dividing point for wood bar instruments was really the development of harmonic tuning in xylophones in 1927 by Henry Schluter, Deegan's chief tuner. Mr. Schluter noted comments from radio stations that broadcast equipment of that day emphasized untuned harmonics in xylophone bars in transmission to the listening audience. Schluter discovered the tuning the harmonic an octave and a fifth above the keynote enhanced the brittle staccato effect of the xylophone played with hard rubber mallets and solved radio's problem. In the wider, thinner marimba bar, the overtone two octaves above the fundamental is tuned to bring out a rich mellow sound with softer wrapped mallets. The scale range, the mallets, and mallet technique used are the other distinguishing differences. The modern Deegan marimba or xylophone begins in Central America in Belize, formerly British Honduras. Far back in the hinterlands from the port of Belize are the forests where as few as one in 250 trees is the botanical species Delbergia stevensonii that provides the high density tropical rosewood needed for Deegan instruments. John Deegan spent nearly three years away from his factory for two purposes. The first was to urge international music authorities to standardize the then chaotic musical pitches. The musical A then in wide use varied from 435 hertz to 454 hertz, which made standardized production of mallet instruments, not to mention woodwinds and other fixed pitch instruments, very difficult. He is known today as the father of A440 pitch. His second purpose was to research tropical hardwoods to find the most desirable material for his instruments. This one variety of Honduras rosewood, cut only from certain sides of the coastal mountain range with proper soil, water, and growing elevation, is the standard which he adopted for Deegan instruments. Deegan's agent in Belize today, who received his degree from University of Edinburgh in forestry and was formerly National Minister of Forests for British Honduras, hand picks the logs for Deegan instruments. They are selected for large size, uniform straight grain, and roundness at a considerable cost premium. This selection represents less than one third of the total harvest of logs because this species typically produces a convoluted and irregular trunk and large trees are the least accessible. The select logs must be loaded on barges for transport to Belize because they are heavier than water and will not float. From Belize, they move by sea freighter to New Orleans and by rail to Chicago, and there are quarter cut in a sawmill. Again, the selection is important since only a log close to round, quartered very carefully, can make a bar with the vertical grain needed to produce good tone. 
A Deegan agent supervises this operation closely. Logs with a bend in them can only be halved and must be cut in the factory to preserve the proper grain structure. Deegan halves the log quarters along knot lines and then air dries and kiln cures them slowly and scientifically. After over a month of steam and dry heat curing in Deegan's kilns, the moisture in the boards is reduced to the required 7% and the stresses are relieved to produce a more durable tone bar. Deegan cuts boards from the quartered logs on a bandsaw to reduce waste on this by now very costly wood. Proper quarter sawing of boards is a key to musical quality. Natural rosewood logs are subject to numerous defects, such as rot, fine hairline cracks, knots, and checking. The woodshop foreman personally selects from each board the sections from which a suitable bar can be made. Again, about 60% of the wood is rejected for poor grain, low density, cracks, knots, or other imperfections. The bar blanks are made straight on two sides on a joiner and then run through a molder with contoured carbide cutters to produce a rosewood blank with the finished bar shape. These blanks are then cut to length for notes in a manner that either cuts out or places pin knots at the nodal points of the bar where they have no adverse effect on tonality. This operation called voicing, along with joining and molding, shrinks the yield of the boards by roughly another 40%. After drilling and sanding, the Deegan Master Tuner tunes the fundamental and harmonic on a carbide tip bandsaw. Each bar has its own individual character or internal structure to be dealt with by the highly skilled judgment of the tuner. Wood, once removed, cannot be put back. Tuning reference bars provide the standard in this, the first of four separate tuning steps. The rough tuning operation using electronic tuning instruments brings the bars to within an established tolerance of the final pitch. After stamping and spray lacquering, the final mass and dimensions of the bar are established and the bars can be precisely tuned to the exact final pitch at 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% ambient humidity in Deegan's precisely controlled final tuning rooms. The assembly department has been carefully constructing the supporting elements of the instrument. The frames of soft maple or beech, end pieces sheathed with walnut grain formica, resonators of custom size extruded aluminum tubing. The final step is the fine adjustment of the resonators to perfectly match the resonant columns of air to the respective bars. The assembly foreman and chief tuner then personally inspect and initial each instrument as meeting Deegan standards before it is released for shipment. In some respects, a mallet percussion instrument is more complex than a piano. From 30 to 52 mallet instrument bars must be individually shaped and tuned to produce their specified pitch, which in most instruments must be reinforced by matched tuning of resonators. Both the piano and mallet percussions are considerably more complicated to manufacture than drums, brass winds, woodwinds, or stringed instruments which use a single resonance chamber for all note pitches. When man moved from the Stone Age to 
the copper and bronze age, his desire for musical expression quickly incorporated the new materials. Cymbals, gongs, and jingles, such as we see on tambourines today, were his first attempts. Later came the complex two notes of chimes and bells. Out of the craft art of bell making in cast brass and bronze, John Deegan again perceived the potential for more highly refined instruments. His development in 1888 of tubular brass chimes for organs was a milestone in the history of the Deegan Company. For the first time, chimes acquired a balanced, symmetrical, sustained tone in each tube, and organ chimes became established as one of the most glorious voices of the king of instruments, the organ. An introduction of tubular brass bell carillons by Deegan in 1916 for the first time put tower bells within the reach of churches outside of the great cathedrals and cities. The development of five-point harmonic tuning by Henry Schluter in 1938 and miniaturization of harmonically tuned rods for the electronic carillon in 1947 brought magnificent tower bell music without the dissonance of the old world bells within the reach of hundreds of churches and institutions. Deegan and his associates spent many months at the mill of the brass supplier experimenting with and refining the alloy specifications and modifying the extrusion process to obtain tubing as nearly perfect as possible. The carefully compounded alloy is poured into a billet mold and the slag removed. The still red-hot billet is extracted from the mold. After being cut into sections, it is drilled and turned. The turning eliminates surface defects and impurities, and the drilling establishes the final inside diameter, which the tube will have for the rest of the process. The intermediate billets move to what is the only vertical extrusion press for brass in the world. This two-story high machine, by extruding the red-hot brass vertically instead of horizontally, maintains a more concentric tube with more uniform wall thickness. After heating in an electric induction furnace, the billets are transferred under the mandrel of the press and squeezed through a tube die by a piston, which exerts over a quarter million pounds of pressure. The tubing literally squirts out of the die onto the lower level of the press, where it is allowed to cool. These tubes are transferred to drawing machines, where they are pulled through dies to reduce the wall thickness by 50% and give the metal a work-hardened temper. The material is monitored closely for surface quality, concentricity, wall thickness, and finally, after annealing in this furnace, for precise temper. If too soft, the ring time and tonality are adversely affected. If too hard, the overtones cannot be tuned. In the Deegan plant, after knurled brass or steel plugs are set in the tubes with a hydraulic press, they are fed through a semi-automatic polishing machine. Hand buffing will then be used to bring the tubes to a mirror bright finish. The basic tube length is tuned on a bandsaw to standard tuning bars. The tubes must be handled with great care to avoid marring the surface. Luster gold chimes are washed with thinner to prevent fingerprints or other contamination and spray lacquered. Chrome chimes move to plating, where several polishing, plating, and washing operations produce a flawless and durable finish. Chrome is the recommended finish for chimes in area of high humidity or air pollution or if the chimes are to be moved frequently. There are five strong notes in each chime tube, one of the most complex musical sounds in the music of man. In tuning marimba bars, the tuner can watch one window of his electronic tuning instrument to tune both the fundamental and overtone frequencies. But a chime tuner 
would have to keep track of five windows almost simultaneously. The adjustment of one chime partial affects the others. Contrary to what one might expect, the human ear is at least as versatile a tuning instrument for this complex tuning as anything our technology has developed. Deegan chime tuners, one of whom is clinically blind, use tuning reference bars and listen for the beat frequencies between and relative decay times of the harmonic notes to tune the chime. Through years of training and experience, they have learned to make the minute adjustments necessary to balance the overtones by squeezing the nodal points of the malleable chime until the irregularities of the tube are canceled. The final tuning operation is a slight trimming of the length of the tube to move the fundamental and partial frequencies exactly on pitch. The sound of a harmonically tuned chime is easily distinguished from one which is only tuned by cutting its length. The sound can be described as being straight, clean, and long-lasting, or symmetrical, or balanced. Untuned harmonics produce slower frequency wows, or higher pitched flutters, tend to die out at different rates. Tuned harmonics support and reinforce one another, extending the ring time and maintaining a balanced decay, and are far more pleasing musically. They also make it possible to play chimes with limited harmony, without the cumulative dissonances which untuned harmonics produce. The one and a half inch heavy wall chimes produce a volume and dynamics with various mallet hardnesses well suited to the symphony orchestra or large ensemble. The smaller one and a quarter inch chimes produce a tone of equal quality but less dynamic volume. Special racks and extensions enable the percussionist to use additional low register chimes in certain orchestral literature which requires them. There is almost no literature requiring chimes higher than the standard one and a half octave C to F concert range which Deegan makes. The Deegan chime rack is equipped for positive control over ring time with a pedal operated damper mechanism. The center board of the felt padded three board assembly engages and dampens the chimes when the pedal is up, releases the chimes to ring free when the pedal is depressed. The rack provides the strength and rigidity needed to support and move the substantial weight of the chimes and has the classical styling of fine orchestral instruments. In chimes, however, the tonality which results from harmonic tuning is of the greatest importance and a prudent purchaser should listen carefully to see that he is acquiring a fine musical instrument rather than a rack of polished brass pipe with only fundamental pitch tuning. Virtually all of the world's major symphony orchestras are equipped with Deegan chimes, and Deegan is the world's largest manufacturer of tubular chimes. The fiber harp is a relative newcomer to the mallet instrument family. As was said, Mr. Deegan's first work was done on steel bar orchestra bells, which won him instant acclaim. He developed many other metal bar instruments, such as the uniform, shaker chimes, musical coins, dinner chimes, and tuning bar standards, one of which was the standard reference pitch for the U.S. Bureau of Standards for many years. The vibra harp derived from his aluminum song bells and the organ vibrato harp. The vibrato harp, developed by Deegan's chief tuner, Henry Schluter, was the first instrument to use the pulsator system which the vibes use today. The Levy Company's vibraphone, introduced in 1924, had steel bars, no damper, and a motor on the floor which pushed the resonator tubes up and down to produce a tremolo. By 1926, this instrument by Levy had adopted Schluter's pulsator system. Schluter then took song bell bars, designed a foot pedal damping system, and incorporated his rotating pulsators driven by a motor mounted on the frame to build in 1927 the first fiber harp. The rich, mellow sound of this aluminum bar fiber harp with overtone tuning overshadowed the metallic tone of the earlier instrument. The new sound, greater musical control, and mechanical simplicity of the fiber harp brought it much widespread popularity, and Levy quickly abandoned the original vibraphone design. All manufacturers from that time have adopted Schluter's final configuration for the vibes. Deegan vibe bars are made from a special alloy extruded in a manner similar to chime tubing on a large extrusion press and then drawn to the final bar profile. 
because it is a far more consistent and predictable material than rosewood, the aluminum alloy bar blank, which has been cut to length, can have the initial tuning cut made on a milling machine. The operator mills the bar to the specified dimension of one one thousandth of an inch for the specific bar and has only to spot check for his musical tolerance. Rough tuning is similar to that of marimba bars in that an abrasive drum is used to remove material and both a fundamental and a dominant partial two octaves above the keynote are tuned. Deegan will not build by bars wider than two inches because other untuned harmonics start to become too loud and clangorous in the wider bars. Orchestra bell, tuning bar, and dinner chime tuning is comparatively simple compared to the so-called octave tuning. And these instruments are used for developing tuner trainees basic skills with appropriate supervision. The musical quality in orchestra bells is much more a function of the steel alloy selected. Aluminum is not an acceptable material to produce the brilliance of orchestra bells. As with chimes, the wise purchaser should listen to bells as a fine set may be indistinguishable in appearance from one made with a soft, dull commercial steel. As with the wood bar and chime families, the manufacturing departments support the vibraharp. The wood shop fabricates frame elements from kiln-dried hardwood lumber with appropriate dovetailing and fasteners and slow-curing glue. Deegan does its own formica lamination. This 36-inch wide belt sander produces a smooth finish on frame end blocks. The assembly of frames requires fixtures and presses of several types. The frames are carefully filled and sanded to finish off fasteners and seams and then move to the spray room for finishing. Deegan regularly services instruments built over 80 years ago to these same high standards, which have withstood the test of time. In the machine shop, seven punch presses perform bar stamping, tuning fork blanking, and small parts stamping and shearing. Deegan is equipped with lathes, turret lathes, press brakes, shears, special drill presses, stacking and riveting machines, and precision saws as well to produce most of its instrument parts in-house. By such means, it is possible to maintain high standards of parts manufacture. The polishing department, for example, has a sandblaster and four polishing lathes in addition to the automatic polishing machine. It is the small details, such as the grinding of the carbon flash off a weld joint before spray painting, that ensures that the paint will strongly adhere and the instrument keep its appearance for a lifetime. These chime hanger studs are hand buffed to remove burrs and extend the life of the cord which suspends the chimes. Any percussionist who has had a chime fall out of its rack during a symphony will appreciate a small detail such as this. Vibe bars are finished to a satin luster in this department also. Not just once, but before rough tuning and again after rough tuning and before clear or baked gold lacquering. Meanwhile, the resonators are individually cut to length, plugs are properly positioned, and the tubes are riveted to the supporting strips. The steel strips used have been copper flashed in plating so that the paint will have better adhesion. Another detail which is never seen, Deegan's master sprayers take great pride not only in what their work looks like when it leaves their department, but what it will look like years hence. The final tuning and assembly of a fiber harp follow methods similar to the wood bars. The fiber harp is one of the very few instruments of wholly American origin to have worldwide popularity. Among the many great vibe artists are Lionel Hampton, the first widely known vibist playing the original Deegan Model 145 with Benny Goodman in the 30s. Other Goodman alumni, now luminaries in their own right, are Terry Gibbs, here in performance with Steve Allen, and Red Norvo in concert. Milt Jackson, for 23 years with the Modern Jazz Quartet, brought vibes to the forefront of jazz. Galen Williams, 
Sir John Jeffrey and numerous others brought the easy listening sound to the world's jazz spots and supper clubs. Today, artists such as Tommy Vig, Bobby Hutcherson, Milt Jackson, Paul Hoffert, Craig Payton, Harry Shepard, and from Germany, Gunter Hampel, are pioneering the new flexibility of the Electrovide, based on a Schluter design, which provides exceptional portability with a very clean, high-gain, amplified vibe sound, compatible with all the waveforming modules used on today's musical frontiers. The mallet instruments, largely due to John Calhoun Deegan's foresight, keen intellect, and demanding standards, are no longer a primitive instrument or a vaudeville novelty. They are an essential part of every percussion ensemble, stage band, jazz combo, school orchestra, community orchestra, and major metropolitan symphony in the world. They are widely taught by many of the pioneering masters, such as Jose Betancourt and Freddie Gomez, and their students now teaching. Advanced degrees are now offered in mallet percussion at many schools of music. Numerous composers, such as Serge Degastine, write for mallet instruments, and competitive scores for school bands almost invariably call for a well-equipped section. In an age when planned obsolescence is the rule, the people at Deegan take great pride in their craftsmanship in building instruments like Mr. Deegan himself did, to last for generations, to produce rich music in the hands of talented artists, and enrich all our lives with the joy of excellence. In an age of planned obsolescence, Deegan strives to continue its tradition of excellence in craftsmanship and durability, to build instruments with fine response and long life. With the broad responsibility for obtaining a multitude of diverse products at the most favorable prices, school purchasing agents cannot be specialists in the fine points of mallet instruments. We have made this film to help you make informed judgments and thereby provide needed recommendations to the purchasing staff. After all, your mutual interest is served best not by the lowest price, but by the best value. Most professionals and award-winning school bands specify Deegan on purchasing requisitions rather than leaving the judgment on the relative values of competing products to someone who is not a specialist. Quality manufacturers such as Deegan depend on discriminating band directors to specify the quality in their requisitions that will assure that instruments of the highest standards will be available to serve their needs.